Welcome to responses of early childhood educators panel. My name is Rode Mola. I'm assistant professor and uh, Bayman family chair for children's spirituality and nurture at Virginia Theological Seminary. I will be moderating this panel discussion this morning. And we do have three panelists. Jagjit Kuwar Panader, early years educator in the United Kingdom. Jane Mata McMahon, University of Maryland, professor of early childhood education with a special interest in bilingual education. Michael Shire, rabbi and professor of Jewish education at Hebrew College, Newton Center, Massachusetts, United States. And we do have an hour and a half for this panel and for main conversation ideas. We will try to use our time appropriately to open it up for public discussion, but knowing that we will not be able to address all of the questions, I would encourage you to share your thoughts and questions in the chat so that we will take those ideas with us and continue the conversation in the classroom with peers and colleagues in the field. Now we are going to enter to the conversation. We will have four main conversation ideas. The first one will be about our expectation of early childhood educators. And the second conversation idea is going to be, what do they expect themselves, early child educators? What responsibilities and expectations they do have? And then we will discuss what empowers them and disempowers them. And finally, we will discuss, we will wrap up the conversation by discussing what kind of life giving practices we can suggest for early childhood educators for ourselves so that they can feel empowered to do this work. So I would call for Jane. Jane, I would you to start the conversation by addressing the idea of what are our expectations of early childhood educators concerning children's spirituality and nurture. Sure, good morning, everybody. I'm Jennifer Mato McMahon. Um, as the intro stated, I'm uh, an associate professor of early childhood education. I'm at, uh, located at um, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in Baltimore, Maryland in the US. Um, and my interest in children's spirituality stems from a secular perspective. So uh, we might have uh, despairing views in terms of what spirituality means and how it is supported or not in, in early childhood. Um, but I am an, uh, a teacher educator and was formerly an early childhood educator and have worked in the classroom with children from uh, ages zero to eight before I became an academic and um, went into higher education. And so my line of research has focused on understanding how spirituality for children can be supported in the classroom by teacher educators, by early childhood educators. And even though traditionally in secular spaces and public schools, spirituality is not necessarily um, supported or even talked about, I believe that it could be the ideal place to support spirituality. I'm looking this way because I have my notes here on the other screen. Um, and want, I want to stay on topic. Um, but there are some hurdles in, in order to achieve that. And what I've found in my research is that there are three main components that in the US, early childhood teachers that are working in secular environments in public schools need to unpack and, and deconstruct their uh, understandings and notions of three main, main constructs. Um, one is the separation of church and state and how we understand that, uh, that the part of our, our, our constitution and how that limits or does not um, the possibility for teachers to support spirituality in the classroom. The second component that needs to be sort of deconstructed is how we understand child development. Um, typically, and when, when teachers go through teacher preparation programs, child development is taught in, in isolation. 
So the areas of development are taught as very um, individualized. And the stages through which children go through are very uh, are, are honed in, in in that capacity. And um, the holistic lens of development is not necessarily explored. Not not to to exclude those who do, but it traditionally um, is not necessarily viewed as with that lens. Um, and then the third aspect that needs to be addressed is the concept and the understanding of spirituality itself. Um, in my work, most, I would say 90% of the time when I ask teachers and just adults um, in general what their spiritual background is, the default response is a question back asking, do you mean my religious upbringing? Because there's a very close consideration between what we understand and how we define spirituality and what we understand or the framework that we have that we probably have been brought up in and culturally are surrounded by that, that has um, the religious component. So there's a, there's a very close association. So from, from my experience, if we address these three constructs and ways of understanding our, our environment, it's very much possible to support and nurture spirituality in the classroom, even if we're talking about secular um, environments, which is not the same hurdle that perhaps religious settings have in terms of supporting spirituality because it's it's it it seems to me that in those kinds of settings it's a given um but this can happen and it can happen it can begin to happen in teacher preparation programs where we're preparing teachers to understand development in a certain way where we can open conversations of exploring and unpacking our understanding and our construct of spirituality and differentiating it from our understanding and experience of whatever religious framework we have. And then understanding the nuances of the separation of church and state that truly do permit us to support spiritual beliefs, spiritual development in secular environments without you know, crossing over to proselytizing or uh, giving preferential treatment to any one religious or spiritual view over the other, yet supporting it and, and opening spaces for it to be nourished. Um, so I think I'll stop there because I know there are other points of views um, and, I'm, and I'm bringing in a very secular, um, a secular one. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives, especially in the sacral context. Now, I would take this conversation to Michael. I want Ravi, Michael, to uh, share your views mainly about what context is this. Jen, I raised the secular one, but I would you to elaborate that. What context is, do we imagine early childhood educators operating or functioning in? So, Jen already addressed the secular part, but I want you to broaden that, uh, addressing religion, it would be culture, other contexts where they are operating or functioning in their social location mainly. Thank you. It's lovely to see everybody, uh, some old friends, uh, some new ones that hopefully we'll make in this session as well. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, I think we have a lot of experts in the room, so to speak, so I hope we'll have some good conversation as well. There's a lot to share. And uh, I think I'll start with a story, which is a good Jewish way to, to start things. It was uh, a while ago, I was working in Britain and each year uh, or each, um, each school has uh, an inspection of its work. And this includes spiritual development, which is part of the religious education curriculum uh, of, the, of the British school system. And this particular inspection was being carried out by two inspectors uh, in the school I was working. Uh, one was a, a secular inspector uh, and one was uh, a religious inspector. 
and the particular event they were inspecting or they were observing was an opening morning assembly of the school uh, in which uh, every morning the school would gather together as a whole school and what they were observing was um, a demonstration of what is fairly typical in in Jewish schools um, which in Great Britain are part of the British um, educational system of the of the uh, of the common schooling and they were watching a group of students who were singing, singing uh, Hebrew songs um, loudly and uh, with great enthusiasm and sometimes um, getting on their chairs um, and making hand gestures around the nature of the songs. Um, these songs come from the Jewish liturgy, so effectively they were prayers and blessings, um, but they were being sung loudly. Um, and these are songs often sang sung um, after one's lunchtime meal um, or um, after any food. And the enthusiasm and the, the intention that was on those children's faces was clear to see. It was, they were concentrated, they were um, delighted, they were uh, singing with a great deal of fervor. At the end of the session, when the two inspectors went off to discuss their observations, the uh, secular observer said, well, I didn't see any spiritual development there. And there was no quietness. There was, children didn't put their hands together in prayer. They weren't reflective of um, God's presence in the world. And the Jewish inspector said, no, 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 <laughs> you've got it wrong. They were extremely spiritual. This is Jewish spirituality at its finest. This is what we call ruach, spirit, uh, enthusiasm, um, the opportunity to really praise God in uh, uh, an open and, and in a sense, uh, a very present way with intention. And the two of them could not agree because their definitions of spirituality were different. So I think we have to consider the cultural context in which spirituality takes place and these may not be the same in all cases. Which isn't to say that there aren't components that we will learn um, and absorb from the societies and the cultures and the contexts in which we're in. And I, for one, have uh, worked in Jewish education uh, for a long time in which we have um, moved our paradigm from um, three different elements. And I just want to reflect those. I'm, I'm drawing from the work of Dr. Ilana Friedman, who works in Chicago, and Professor Maya Muller, who is at the University of, Southern, uh, of, uh, of South Carolina. They talk about these three paradigms within Jewish education that we are, have expectations of for early childhood education. The first is what we call, which many people will know, we call the melting pot. The idea that um, culturally our children will just mix in with others. We, I think, all know by now the problems with that. Um, it uh, obviously creates a normative culture, which in this in North America, the North American case is a whiteness. Um, it uh, has a dominance of that culture. It creates uh, a situation where marginalized peoples, people of color, um, people of different faiths that are not in the majority um, are different from the norm. And it uh, aspires to an assimilation, which, um, which we are not necessarily favoring. So we have moved away from that melting pot um, image that was very much part of the immigrant, immigration generation uh, in the Jewish community at the turn of the, the 19th century and the 20th century. Then we move to what um, Professor Friedman and Professor Muller call the salad bowl metaphor, which was the metaphor of a multiculturalism. That multiculturalism did provide for a pluralism. It provides for um, at least a desire for equity um, and uh, is somewhat critical. But as they suggest, this is really a tourist view of um, being part of a, again, of a normative community, a normative society, again, where whiteness is dominant, where race and gender um, have a normative sense and where everything else is other. 
Um, and there are always bits in the salad that you don't want that you take out or that you um, you want to choose which parts you like, and which parts you don't like. So the salad bowl metaphor doesn't really work anymore either. And so we move uh, in their words um, to what we call in the Jewish um, context, the Seder plate. The Seder plate is the particularly ritual object that we use for the Passover. Uh, Seder, the Passover night, where we celebrate the festival of freedom. And we use this metaphor um, because now we're going to begin to talk about culturally relevant pedagogy. The idea that we need to activate social justice, we need to be critical in our uh, understanding of this pedagogy, we need to understand ourselves as activists in this pedagogy, and that we need to have a critical lens with which to view the work that we do. And we'll probably be, I'm sure we'll be talking more about examples of this in the early childhood classrooms. But within um, the Jewish community, we obviously have a great deal to work on with regard to our own contexts, that is the um, derivations of Jewish communities from around the world and from different parts of the world, Jews of color, Jews of different genders and races, Jews um, of uh, Ashkenazi, that is Central Europe, and Jews of Sephardi, that is Southern Europe, uh, ancestry, which is very different, both in terms of culture and context, um, as well as um, understanding the uh, the opportunity to have this critical view, this critical lens upon the pedagogy that we offer. So moving from the melting plot to the salad bowl to the, the Seder plate is an opportunity to begin to think about our pedagogy in a culturally critical context. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi Shire. So I would move uh, now to Jeep Jack. And I would you to address how do socio-political realities, Ravi Shire uh, touched some of the ideas, but I would you to elaborate that, how do socio-political realities such as race, gender, and class, and cultural contexts affect our expectations, and how do early childhood educators enact or do their work in the everyday? Hello, my name's Japjit, and uh, I work in a Sikh nursery, which is based in the United Kingdom. And it's one of the first nurseries um, which is faith-based. And we take a lot of the practices from the Sikh faith into um, how we educate the children and the kind of atmosphere that's created in order to serve the families um, and the children who attend the setting. One of the aspects that really stood out from my recent um, academic research is that there needs to be an acknowledgement of the intergenerational and the ancestral um, activity that has taken place um, with previous generations. So my, my grandparents who moved from India to Africa and my parents who moved from Africa to the United Kingdom, there were lots of intergenerational traumas and um, aspects of um, healing that was required um, on my from my point of view, for me to become an educator for the children who attend the setting. This required a level of understanding um, with the, the race of, with the faith that was practiced in, the, um, in India, as well as how the faith was practiced in Africa. So there's lots, lots of cultural aspects that are coming through from that. Um, there was a very solid link with um, the place of education and actually understanding how those socio-political um, contexts actually are um, delivered amongst third, fourth generation Sikhs. It's become apparent that children also need to have a healed educator who can actually change that practice um, amongst early years, early childhood and be able to actually be nurtured in the, in the early years environment that um, they are put in. Um, that's a lot to do with the educator themselves and actually the work that goes on behind the scenes um, to be able to express free freely and be able to have that understanding of um, what is happening um, in early childhood. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I would 
return the conversation to Ravi Shair. I want you to say a little more about, about religious commitments and historical experience of discrimination, how these kinds of realities shape you know, our expectations of early childhood educators. Religious commitment and historical, what was the last word? Historical uh, experiences of discrimination right. uh, shape our expectation of early childhood educators. So um, I think we, we should go to um, an understanding of the very nature of, of what we're trying to do in a minority of culture and um, ethnic group such as the Jewish community in North America. We're, we're trying to do at least two things, obviously many. Um, we're trying to, on the one hand, sustain a, a small community that um, has had a um, traditional um, sense of um, being persecuted and oppressed, particularly in uh, societies that wanted to other uh, various groups, um, whether it was the Jewish community or indeed uh, people of color or LGBT um, people. And that, um, that sense of marginalization, that sense of persecution, sense of oppression has not gone away from the Jewish community, despite the fact that um, this is now, you know, one would look at the Jewish community in North America and consider it to be, um, you know, having succeeded in in the sense of the what used to be called the American dream, um, and you know, made them made their mark in society. So that um, understanding of who we are is um, continues to uh, impose itself upon the very nature of what we think we need to do with the uh, generations that come after us in order to protect ourselves from any of those um, difficult circumstances that um, have been part of, uh, if we like to think about it, um, unfortunately, for over 3000 years across the global world. And so it's not just obviously a North American phenomenon, but of course, recent growth and rise of antisemitism, indeed all uh, race hatred, um, and antisemitism is a race hatred. Um, it is a Jew hatred and people are now uh, trying to prefer uh, getting away from the term antisemitism, which nobody seems to know what it is, uh, particularly uh, research done with young people who uh, define themselves as anti-racist um, you know, and anti-Semitic, because that was kind of the way they understood the, the way the word worked. So um, we are beginning to use the word Jew hatred uh, as a way to express what is happening uh, in North America and um, also in other places around the world. So that continues to, unfortunately, um, promote uh, an inwardness within our community, a sense of looking within, and it restricts sometimes the outwardness that, in fact, the purpose, uh, as we understand it, of, of Judaism and the Jewish religion is to be a light unto the nations, to be uh, uh, an expression of God's will for a more perfect world in order to repair the world that we live in. We call that tikkun, uh, tikkun olam, to repair the world. That's the mission of Jewish life. So how can we live within a world? How can we educate our next generation, um, particularly our very youngest, to feel safe, uh, to feel they have a role in tikkun, in making the world a better place, and yet at the same time to feel protected um, and to feel that they will be safe um, in the worlds in which they grow up. And that is a tension that I think the Jewish community continues to live with. Um, and when we put an overlay upon that of a spiritual life, which as I see it, is um, trying to develop a life of meaning for a young person that will stay with them the rest of their uh, adult life as well, to use early childhood as a foundation for building uh, a search for a life of meaning, for seeking uh, to continue to ask those wondering questions about 
the big things in life that confront them and to feel that those questions are valid and worthwhile um, and to be living in a in a um, to constructing a life that reflects that searching when we want that to be part also of an early childhood education we have to have a safe and brave space in which that will be allowed and that uh, creates um, both as I said some sense of looking inwards towards our own community its traditions and its legacies but also hopefully are looking outward to the world at large and to being able to um, as I said earlier to have that cultural consciousness context in which we can share that uh, sense of self and a spiritual awareness with all peoples uh, that we come across with in in the in the worlds which we inhabit thank you ravi and all of you it was a powerful reflection so for the last 25 minutes we discussed about our expectations of early childhood educators. Now we are moving to the second conversation idea. And now we are going to discuss for the coming 15 or 20 minutes, what do early childhood educators characterize or expect of themselves? What's their expectation about their own responsibilities being a child, early childhood educators? So I'm going to bring that question first to Japjit, Japjit, you yourself being an educator and having an international and intercultural experience, I want you to reflect on this question. How do early childhood educators characterize their responsibility and expectations of being in that position? Um, I think it's been quite a recent transformation for me to actually understand that working on myself is what's really going to make a difference in um, early childhood uh, as an educator. Um, and because of that, there's almost, um, there's got to be a willingness to transform yourself as well. So almost be able to work in a spiritual way yourself um, to look inwards will change to how you work outwards as well. And I think that's a really powerful message. And it's a powerful responsibility because actually you are implementing that and having that impact upon the children around you. To be able to sit or express or talk about, be able to start using words to define spirituality. Spirituality is, can be defined in so many ways secular, religious, non-religious, we can look in all different directions. I think what becomes really powerful is if we start asking those questions very, very early on, the children to actually reflect and be able to think about it or express. So I think one of the key aspects for myself as an educator was to be willing to transform myself, be willing to have those experiences, be willing to feed off the souls that are within the setting that will have an impact on me. I may be older, I may be an educator, but the thing is, we don't know where these souls have traveled from and actually what, how they present themselves in the setting. They may be here to educate me. And I think that's great power in what we hand over to the child, handing that baton back to the child and think about, well, what, we, what can we learn from the innocence of this child? What can we learn from this connection or this freedom to express or this um, being able to sit and not have conversation. I certainly find that difficult at times not to be able to sit and you know quiet the mind but somehow through play children are able to do that. So what can we actually learn from the children? Um, one aspect that really stands out for me is the nurturing element. Nurturing doesn't mean it's a direct lesson. It is about nurturing, being able to give that well-rounded experience, um, opportunities, putting out those experiences for children to, to either take part or not. And again, there's great power in the choice of saying no. And I think sometimes the lessons around that, we as an educator, it can seem very driven towards getting children to respond, but for them to, for you to put something out there and for them to say, it's okay, okay, we can sit, we can let them reflect on it. And if they choose to respond to it, that's great power being handed to the child. And I think, so bringing it to the point of um, responsibility, I think the greatest responsibility is to not feel that we have to make that change. 
the responsibility is being able to give the child the space. And I think that's such a great power for the child um, and as well for us as educators. Thank you, Dr. That was so powerful. And uh, I will move this conversation to Jen. Jen, I want you already started this uh, in your previous response, but I will hear also more about how do early childhood educators understand and define spirituality and spiritual nurture of uh, children, uh, mainly in the secular context, since you are there, um, you have a different perspective on that. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. Sure. So um, in, in a preliminary study that I conducted with uh, my research team, we, we surveyed 33 early childhood educators and we're targeting public school teachers or uh, private early childhood centers that are secular, not non-religious, non-faith based. And what we found in that pilot study was that teachers were defining or early childhood educators were defining spirituality from three sort of large constructs. One had to do with seeking to establish connections, to, to make connections, be it with themselves, be it with others, be it with nature, or be it with something transcendent or beyond um, intangible. The second component that they talked about was practicing virtues. So spirituality had to do with, for them and their understanding of it, had to do with um, how we relate to others and, and how we behave and interact with others. So that practice of virtues was another component. And the third one was about making meaning and understanding and making meaning of the world. Um, we expanded this study and uh, sent that survey out to 365 uh, teachers and early childhood educators across the U.S. And we targeted, uh, we were able to collect from 36 different of the 50 states in the U.S. And we asked them that same question, um, what do you understand children's spirituality to be? So how would you define this? And we found that um, it expanded that initial pilot that we found from the 33 and that the teachers were asking or answering this question for from three different vantage points. Some of them were looking at, and the majority, this one was the category that had the, the highest frequency of response, focused on spirituality as essence. So the essence of spirituality in their definition. And within that essence, they talked about the mystical component of spirituality. Within the mystical component, they talked about God, they talked about Jesus, they talked about the universe, they talked about a higher power. Um, th but they also talked, aside from the mystical component and the essence of spirituality, about self and how spirituality had to do with the self and how the self manifested its, itself in this physical material um, world. Um, they also talked about values and they talked about purpose and meaning, which kind of reflected what we found in the in the pilot study. That was one approach to answering the question was, what is the essence of spirituality? And again, as I said, that was the one that had the highest frequency, but other approaches focused on looking at the origin of spirituality. So some teachers responded that question, what do you uh, understand children's spirituality to be from a source perspective? So where does it originate? So some of, for some of them, spirituality was originally externally, and it had to do with who teaches the children or who is responsible for teaching spirituality to the children, to helping them learn about spirituality. And others thought that the origin of spirituality was internal. So it had to do with an in intrinsic, innate, <clears throat> inherent component of being human that we were born with that would develop over time. And that's where it originated. So that was the second category. The third category had to do with actions. So going back to that uh, um, practicing virtues that we found in the pilot, these were the folks that thought that spirituality had to do with uh, the way that we behave towards others, the way that we enact, um, the, the adherence to ethics and moral, uh, to, to aspects of, of good um, and right and wrong, 
kind of behaviors and that that reflected those kinds of behaviors reflected what they understood spirituality to be. So it was interesting. Uh, and we're still, you know, as you can imagine, 365 <laughs> qualitative, this is all qualitative data, open-ended questions. Um, it requires a lot of time to go through, but it was interesting as sort of a preliminary analysis is that even though we were targeting teachers in secular educational settings, the highest frequency of response had to do with understanding spirituality with this from this essence mystical perspective. And within our codes, the highest frequency, the code with the highest frequency was the, was the code of God. So they were still understanding spirituality with this connection to God, even in these um, secular spaces in which they uh, worked. So that, that's interesting. And, and that then reflected, this is a, a broader survey, so that that then reflected also in the way that they facilitate, support, nurture spirituality in the classroom, which we also um, talked about. But in terms of their understanding, we were seeing that there was these three distinct ways of coming to answering this question from, from these educators. Thank you, Jen. That was very detailed analysis of uh, how early childhood educators understand children's spirituality. So I will take uh, the conversation now to Ravi uh, Shire. I want you to address what empowers and disempowers uh, early childhood educators to fulfill their own expectations, their own responsibilities. So I want us again to maybe go back to the culture and context and the everyday realities they are facing. Uh, so please. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. That was very interesting. And I think we'd all be interested to read that study. So maybe you could put the references in the chat. Um, fascinating. And I think that obviously uh, concurs with a lot of the research that's been done in uh, children's spirituality over the last 25 years or so that um, does discuss this innate nature of spirituality as a part of children's development, that it is not an add-on, but rather uh, integral to their sense of centering self, and that they are beginning to grow um, in this work. Uh, and we as pedagogy uh, experts need to understand what this work is and how to nurture it. Um, Chapter talked about nurturing and that the importance of cultivating and nurturing this this very innate sense of what it means for children to come to a, a sense of knowing uh, what you call essence, um, a sense of knowing in a, in a different way from the knowing that we know other things. We have concentrated in the Western world on knowing skills, information, knowledge, um, and there is uh, another sense of knowing that we need to nurture as well, and that knowing is very present in early childhood. It's a natural component of early childhood. Children will talk openly about their companionship with God, their friendship with God, their the, the, the sense of the mystery of life that accompanies them every day, the questions they have, the wonderings they have. So I, I will just respond um, in with my experience of how to turn this into a pedagogic intention, and that's through the work of uh, Godly Play and Torah Godly Play. And we have Cheryl Miner with us, who is the director of uh, research at the Godly Play Foundation, and uh, I'm hoping she'll also um, uh, come in on this conversation because we we take the the two things that are so important in uh, the educational life of of young children: that story and play. In fact, uh, I don't know if Lakeisha is still here. She was here earlier, but Lakeisha and I just spoke at an adult education institute, the Chautauqua Institute um, in northern New York, and we both spoke on the nature of play. And uh, I introduced the, the the community there to the nature of um, godly play and the Jewish adaptation of godly play, which is called Torah Godly Play. And there were also representatives of the Quaker community there who talked about um, play, I can't remember the name of the title of it, um, story and play, something in play. Um, faith and play, thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, so the idea that, and, and Jennifer was alluding to this earlier, the idea that play is an, is an innate and important way in which children will 
begin to wonder and discuss and to engage and connect through story, uh, particularly sacred story, that is stories from the Hebrew Bible or indeed for other communities through other testaments, the, the very way in which they can begin to address these huge questions of life and death um, through the nature of the stories that have been told, uh, the dream stories, uh, some of our teachers will call them, the dream stories of our traditions that are not intended to be histories, uh, they're not intended to necessarily be theologies, they are, they are in fact dream stories, they are part of our consciousness of certainly of the Western world, um, and that they have um, obviously informed and been absorbed into our cultures in, in such a huge way. So that everything you spoke about, uh, Jennifer, with regard to practicing virtues, of uh, connecting, of making meaning, that all derives from um, the sacred stories that we have told over thousands of years. And those stories have been uh, part of um, our very identities as, as people um, who are inside a culture, inside a cultural context. And that for us includes a, a, a spiritual one. So engaging with those stories in such a deep, a close way, a uh, Jewish tradition has a long history of um, close reading of the Hebrew text um, and a collaborative reading of the Hebrew text with a partner called a chavruta uh, in the Aramaic word for partner. So we, we read these texts in community. We read these texts together. These are not solitary readings, but rather readings in which shared meaning um, is a part of the very essence of trying to understand the meaning of this text and the meaning for the self um, that uh, Jennifer also talks about. So um, for those of you who are familiar with Godly Play will understand the power um, that comes from children working with story, and, and that's the Montessori word for play. Um, Maria Montessori said that the, um, the work of children is play. And I, I love this definition of play from um, Vygotsky, who says that play is an imaginary world in which unrealized needs can be satisfied. Play is an imaginary world in which unrealized needs can be satisfied. And that goes to the very heart, I think, of what spiritual searching is all about, that we can imagine ourselves in a world in which our, our needs uh, can be satisfied and we can work towards those uh, those worlds that we seek uh, for the future. And um, that includes a social justice agenda, includes the tikkun that I mentioned earlier, includes looking out. Um, at the world in which we're in and trying to repair some of those um, those things that are broken and teaching uh, at a very early age uh, from in early childhood how children can go about doing that within their own classroom context the very nature of what it means to to forgive a hurt to um, to calm oneself to find one's own um, self-discipline um, to have the self-esteem that uh, you have a place in this world, that you are an important part of this classroom, um, that everyone here has a role to play, everyone here is important and we value everyone's presence in this early childhood classroom. These are all aspects of teaching these virtues and practicing these virtues that need to be nurtured. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravi. And I would uh, take the conversation to Jabjit. Jabjit, I want you to again address how does a lack of opportunities for professional growth, as yourself being an educator for uh, for children, uh, uh, affect early childhood educators and their ability to be prosumers, consumers, and producers at the same time in this work. Mostly early childhood educators are consumers. They don't, you know, produce and they don't share because they don't lack, they lack uh, professional uh, development. So I want you to share that uh, using your lived experience and expertise in the field. Well, one aspect that really stood out for our setting is that we focused on a very original tradition that was used by, by our first prophet, Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And that was using the traditional me medium of music, which is known as Githan. And what he did was he traveled um, widely, globally, um, to different areas, not being able to speak the language of the community, but be able to pass on a message of God or spirituality in a way through music that others understood. 
Um, so how we have brought that into our setting is geese that there's a sacred space that is created every morning within the setting. All the members of staff and children come together and we reenact re that same Gita every single morning. It gives the children a chance to be in that sacred space, to be, belong, interconnect, so that nurture, the nurturing that is actually going on in that time. Now, how that transforms the child and being able to take tradition um, in 2023 to have an impact on these children from the early years, it introduces the language in which the Holy Scriptures are originally written in. So rather than having to tap into other people to understand what the message of God is or what the message of spirituality is, it is actually putting children on that pathway to be able to discover, interpret and understand themselves, which in itself is a, a very powerful position for the child to, uh, the journey for the child to be on. And because of that, rather than just following suit with what curriculums are stating and following learning and development kind of agendas, those political agendas, it is actually, again, bringing all of the tradition and acknowledging that these children are already beings. They are beings in this universe and they have a place. They have a place and we have to appreciate that to be able to um, begin their journey on discovering what their spirituality, what their purpose is, what their identity is. And that's where I think the role of the educator becomes even more paramount in allowing children to discover who they are. Thank you, Dabji. Thank you so much. So we have been discussing uh, this far about our own expectations of early childhood educators, and then we addressed, you know, what do they themselves, the educator, expect about themselves, their responsibilities, how they define spirituality, and what's, you know, uh, creating problem for them to achieve their goals, their responsibilities. And now we are moving uh, to our third main conversation idea. And I want then again to respond to this question using your, your studies or your experience as a, as a professor. What encourages and impedes the fulfillment of these expectations, the expectations we have uh, for uh, early childhood education, educators, and also the expectation themselves like early childhood educators have for their own responsibilities uh, teaching uh, children, nurturing the spirituality of children. What are the issues that are encouraging and also impeding uh, these uh, realities? So um, I recently collaborated with an early childhood educator um, for the, the, the completion of a, a book that is coming out soon. And I was writing this book from a theory to practice perspective, um, looking at the research, looking at the findings and looking at what teachers are doing, currently doing in the classroom or not. Um, and it, it, it came as a suggestion from my editor actually to include, to collaborate with a teacher in the classroom that might be doing this. And so I thought, oh, this is gonna be like finding a needle in a haystack, right? So how am I gonna find a teacher in a public school in the US that is actually nurturing spirituality in the classroom? And serendipitously, I was teaching a workshop on translanguaging and bilingual education. It had nothing to do with spirituality, but in the introduction of me as a speaker, they mentioned that my line of research was children's spirituality. So in the lunch break, a teacher that was in this workshop approaches me and says that she's really interested in this topic, that she is a Montessori trained certified teacher and she's working in a public school, which is one of our partner schools that we, that we collaborate with. And reason why she was in this workshop and that she was really interested in my take on spirituality. And from that conversation developed a thin collaboration in inviting her to write a couple of uh, chapters of this book that is coming out recently, in which she talks about how her training as a Montessori, as a certified Montessori teacher, taking 
Montessori's fundamental notions of the spirit of the child and how teachers, that's part of teachers' responsibility that Javi did talk about before as well, um, and how that can be done. And how she then negotiated with her principal, with the administrators of her school, how she could continue to do that, even though she was now teaching in a secular public school that was not necessarily a Montessori um, charter school or that had any Montessori philosophy attached to it, but because she had that philosophy and she had done um, like we were talking about before, the internal work of giving it the of owning the responsibility as an educator of that was part of her mission in the classroom. She wanted to continue doing that, although now she was in a different kind of school setting. And so in this book, and I can link the book, it's it's not out yet. It's it's available for pre-order at, uh, currently at the moment. But in those chapters, she talks about how that training and that philosophical framework that she brings to the classroom informs now her pedagogy as an early childhood educator and how that translates into specific activities, specific ways in, she, in which in she weaves this into the curriculum and how she facilitates that for the classroom. Yet from my perspective as an outsider, I can see how that took considerable intentionality on her part to be able to do that, to negotiate that with the administrators in her building, to be able to then partner with her co-teachers to be able to facilitate that. And she talks in, in those chapters in that book, in the book, about some of the, the barriers, right? So because not everybody that she works with has her same philosophical approach to teaching. Um, and how then she nav navigates those, those um, conversations with her co-teachers that are in the classroom and how do they then address behavioral management, for example? How do they give time and pauses for children to think and ponder? How do they approach, how do we interact and relate to each other in the classroom? And then how did the teacher relates and uh, in their figure of authority in the classroom with the children. And it's really interesting to, to read about the lived experience of a teacher who's trying to, and is nurturing spirituality in the classroom from that particular perspective of that theoretical Montessori framework, but uh, allowing the spirit of the child to be the guide in her pedagogical approach within the constraints of all of the requirements that public school teachers have in the US and meeting curriculum and meeting standards and having children you know, be, be assessed by standardized testing. And within all of those constraints, still it is possible to do it. And it's really um, illuminating and, and, and gives us a lot of hope to see that teachers are finding ways to navigate those barriers and limitations and still support this in the classroom. Beyond you know, their understanding of spirituality, beyond their understanding of what I said before of the separation of church and state that sort of con con confines us here, um, it's still possible, doable, and it is happening in the classroom. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for sharing the possibility of uh, being able to uh, actually fulfill these expectations. Sometimes it's hard to believe that, but uh, thank you for sharing that reality. So I will again bring back this conversation to Ravi to you. I want you to address about diversity, how diverse contexts affect the realization of these expectations, you know, the possibility or the impossibility and how diverse contexts or diversity is affecting that reality. I go back to a very important talk that Deborah Ball gave at the uh, 2018 AERA conference. I, I don't know if people um, have been able to pick that the definitive lecture up, but she talks about re-imaging the instructional triangle. And all of our teachers have been taught the instructional triangle, um, student teacher uh, content, and that triangle that that operates on three on three angles. And we all we all know that very well. She and, and she was very much part of constructing that triangle in its original form. 
But in 2018, and this of course is just before um, the uh, issues that have arisen in the United States with regard to Black Lives Matter and to, um, uh, to COVID, still she almost um, poignantly and um, with prescience uh, begins to talk about re-imaging that instructional triangle in order to understand that we are not value neutral in our education, even with early childhood children, we're not value neutral. Education has a, an intentional aspect of cultural competence. And we have got to be aware um, of what we are doing when we are using the instructional triangle uh, to be pedagogues, to be teachers, because uh, she indicated there that the, the very thought that the classroom is an enclosed and sterile environment in which we can just treat children to be nice to each other um, has long gone and that we have got to understand this permeable membrane that takes place between what is happening in the childhood and the, the, the greater and the wider world outside of it. Um, and that that wider world informs who we are as teachers, it informs the very context in which the education is taking place and the, of course the responses and the attitudes that are coming from parents to children in the classroom. And she wanted us uh, at that time to be aware of what she calls both constraint and discretion in the life of the teacher, to understand that constraint, that what the teacher constrains herself to do and the discretion that she uses um, in her classroom <clears throat> really determines what kind of a classroom it will be. And um, Rhoda, you were asking me about diversity. As I said before, if we rely only on this kind of um, melting pot or salad bowl um, pedagogy, we will basically create a society in which whiteness is the normative um, and in which uh, Christianity will be normative um, and in which um, heterosexual men um, become the norm for uh, and the ideal for everyone to aspire to, which is of course completely um, incompatible and impossible. So um, I take the, the work of um, Sibs Bishop, who allows us to talk about windows and mirrors in particularly for early childhood children to understand that there are windows and mirrors and that the mirrors in our classrooms, the mirrors that we use to look upon ourselves need to reflect everyone there, everyone who's in that classroom, whether you are in, in my context, whether you are a Jew of color, you are um, um, you have a neurodiverse um, approach to, to learning, you are LGBT identified, you have uh, a gender fluidity, whatever, and, and this will of course be present in early childhood these days as well, um, that whatever you're coming with, that that mirror reflects everyone who is with us and is part of us, and that we learn from the mirrors that are with us in the classroom. And we have got to be able to reflect um, that diversity within our, on our walls, um, with our pictures, with our graphics, uh, in our books that we use um, on our websites. Um, and schools and early childhood centers need to be thinking uh, very carefully about the graphic images they are portraying and how those images uh, reflect the diversity. That is the mirror to, to early childhood and to the lives of the children um, that reflect that. And of course, the windows then open up the worlds, the outside, who is not with us, whose voice is not in our room. Uh, maybe we don't have a wheelchair um, uh, child uh, who, is, uh, who is bound to a wheelchair, but who um, is part of perhaps a wider world that we need to look at. What does that world look like for a child uh, in that particular case? How do we understand their world? What is the window through which we can look at to look at the world outside? The world we inhabit. And so we have to understand that um, permeable membrane between the inner classroom and the outer world has got to be a very much part of our work as educators to develop that window as well. And um, Sims Bishop talks about the sliding glass door that you can turn a mirror into a window by opening the sliding glass door and walking out into the world. And we're, that's an ideal for us as educators.
Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for addressing the importance of diversity um, in the lives of children. Um, that's that's really important. And thinking about the voices that are not heard, um, uh, mainly, you know, when we do children's spirituality, we think about the children we see every day in our classroom. But there are diverse voices. There is diversity even in that um, in that. Um, in, in those groups. So it's important to think about that. And thank you for addressing that. So if we acknowledge for the need for diversity, and I think uh, our approach for addressing children's spirituality and nurture will be intersectional. So I want Dapti to address the idea of intersectionality in relation to our expectations. You know, that's important for early childhood educators and for children themselves. So what's intersectionality in relation to the expectations we have been discussing for an hour this far? I think I'd like to just um, continue from the point that um, Rabbi Shai has just made about diversity. We look at diversity, um, you know, in the wider context, um, you know, amongst uh, wheelchair users. But actually, one of the even community bases, communities have a fear of um, practicing or exploring spirituality because um, there there is a non acceptance of diverse uh, understanding of different concepts. And I think even within smaller communities, it's really important to accept diversity is present and actually expression of different uh, of their faith will be in different ways because that's how we will kind of avoid any kind of discrimination and any kind of um, issues that might arise within those communities. One of the frameworks that has been introduced in the United Kingdom is the um, spiritual, moral, moral, social and cultural framework, which allows early childhood settings to be able to access um, religious education within their settings, but without the um, link to religion, so to speak. But it really gives a good stepping stone for us as educators to tap back into um, religious sources and be able to connect back to the diversity that's required for children and their experiences. Thank you, Dabji. Thank you. So, Jane, I want you to uh, uh, say a little more, you know, about this expectation. What does it mean to have this diverse perspective as a in a community or as a society, and how does this impact children themselves? Uh, and at the same time, early childhood educators having a diverse community or intersectional perspective uh, impacts uh, children and their educators, this social political reality. So I would you to address that uh, from a social political perspective. Well, <laughs> that's a tall order, I think. Um, but. I think I, I want to go back to what Jap, Jap did, and excuse me if I'm pronouncing or mispronouncing your name, but said about um, letting the child lead. Um, we, and, and, and we can see in this room, we're all adults here that are concerned with issues um, that pertain to children. Um, and when we are in rooms with children, we tend to be, you know, the, the, the responsible adult, the one that has the um, onerous responsibility to, to get the tasks done or, or accomplish the, the deeds that we're here to do. Um, looking back at the instructional triangle to get that content delivered, right? To get the instructional, the learning process, teaching learning process going. And we're talking about educational context. Um, yet as early childhood educators, um, and it will, it will depend on your teacher preparation program, but as early childhood educators that come from a social constructivist perspective, um, we know that learning happens experientially um, through play, through hands-on firsthand experiences, and that those instructional experiences that are most impactful for children are those that reflect their interest, their curiosity, what drives them. And if 
as adults, we're not child-centered in how we develop instruction. Um, it's my opinion that we're doing a disservice to the children and that we have so much to learn from their understanding and their vantage point of how they see the world around them. That if we were to put them first, put them as we would say in the driver's seat, when we're talking about instructional uh, approaches um, and learning in, in educational environments, but also when we're trying to nurture the spirit and looking at the child from a holistic lens, consider them as a human being first um, with a soul and giving them then that driver's seat and taking their lead, we would be our, our job to be inclusive, to honor diversity, to have uh, not just tolerance, but complete inclusion and acceptance of all the differences that we bring in as human beings with different cultural and, and, and historical backgrounds would be so much easier if we took the lead from the children instead of coming us with this title of a, a responsible adult um, that is the one that knows how and is um, the ultimate uh, responsible for person for getting us where we want to go in 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 this in, in instructional uh, experience. I think that would be a first step, and it would be a huge step in getting us into this um, a, a more harmonious, a more um, human-centered experience of, of teaching and learning would be to, to really <clears throat> put the child at the, at the forefront. Just to add on to that, Jennifer, yes. Rebecca, Rebecca Nye talks about the difference between listening to the children and listening for the children. And listening to the children is obviously a, is, is, is paying attention to the children but listening for the children is is really going deeper and understanding the needs those what i called earlier the unrealized uh, needs of the children so that they will be um addressed in the very nature of the work that we do so yes i completely concur with that thank you thank you both thank you jane for saying we took the lead from the children that was so powerful um, so we have been discussing almost, we have all, only 20 minutes left and we discussed our expectation of early childhood educators and the expectation early childhood educators have for themselves. And we discuss what encourages and impedes these fulfillment is the, the expectations we have for early childhood educators. Now we are going to wrap up this conversation by discussing what positive approaches might you share for early childhood educators. Most of you raised the idea of storytelling and godly play and uh, some of the traditions from the Jewish tradition. Uh, but I want you even to elaborate and discuss more on that. And Ravi, you can start this conversation and I would give for Jane and Jabjit, and then we will try to open it up to a public conversation. I'm, I'm happy to, um, I think I've said enough about my work, so I'm happy to hear from other people. Yes, Jabjit? I think I've been in a really crucial position to be able to tap into the spirituality of the Sikh community that we serve in the United Kingdom. Um, I don't think it's been done. Um, it, I've looked at ideologies like godly play, sacred space, um, giving the voice and the authority to the child and really bringing that into um, looking at it from a Sikh perspective looking at the traditions of the faith and being able to bring those traditions into um, the values and the virtues and the moral kind of um, development that we can provide the children with the type of experiences that help will help them to understand their sense of identity and purpose, as well as their spirituality. So by bringing all of those traditions into the setting, not only does it 
has great power for the child, but it actually has great power for us as educators as well. And I think that's probably the key point for me to take away from today and listening to all the others as well. Thank you, Dabjit. So Jane? I just wanna echo some of the um, <clears throat> activities and some of the experiences that teachers have shared with us in, in, <clears throat> in using that instrument, uh, that survey that then turned into a validated instrument. Teachers shared that they, uh, the different things that they were doing to support and nurture spirituality in the classroom, in the secular classroom, um, <clears throat> were offering mind breaks, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> offering mind breaks to children, uh, using activities and techniques of, of, to promote mindfulness, uh, using meditation techniques, providing periods of quiet time or silence for the children to you know, gather themselves, gather their thoughts, uh, allowing time for conversations to occur, allowing children's big pondering questions to be asked and to be discussed, um, to sort of lose the fear of not having the right or the correct answer to those questions, but just opening the conversation to, to, to have the children interact with each other and explore their perspectives to those answers and um, modeling care and kindness. So having them be a, a, a model to emulate, to um, <clears throat> guide <clears throat> sort of the tone. And I think um, it was mentioned before how the teachers, what they bring to the classroom really determines the, the cultural climate that the classroom has. Um, so to, to be that kind of model. Um, they also mentioned materials such as books, music, <clears throat> exposure to nature, interactions with nature, and um, activities like yoga or, or body movement activities that also allowed uh, the environment, the classroom environment, to be a, a spiritually nurturing space. And these are some of examples that they that they gave, um, and th they shared with us, you know, how how frequently they did these or or not in in the classroom. Thank you, Jen um, and uh, Jabjit and Ravi Shire for uh, responding to these questions uh, clearly and precisely. We have 15 more minutes and uh, we will open it for you. We have, we have been discussing as a group to make it a public conversation. So if you have questions or reflections about our expectations of early childhood educators um, or you know some practices that you want to share to empower and nurture children's spirituality, it's time for you uh, to discuss, okay? I see uh, Paulus, um, you can speak. I don't know if I pronounce your name correctly. Okay, thank you for this moment. And thank you for the presentation of the speakers. My question is uh, only one. What kind of play that you make in your class? Thank you. Yes, uh, can Jane, can you respond to that question? I'm sorry, the question was what kind of play? Play yeah. you use in the classroom. What kind yeah. of play? Um, <clears throat> well, any play that is child initiated is, is what we consider play in early childhood education. Um, so uh, play when, and, and this I'm going, I'm pulling back to a class on play that I teach my students, um, but play when it's, initiated, directed, or um, <clears throat> voluntarily um, imagined by children is the kind of play that we're that we're looking for. The teacher orchestrates. So you're you're sort of the the prop manager of behind the scenes that selects of materials and sets up the classroom environment in a way that is appropriate for the age group that you're working with. But the children are the ones that come up with the ideas of how to interact with these materials. And the more open the teacher is to use materials in alternative kinds of ways and allow children sufficient time for um, exploration of creativity and imagination is the kind of play that would 
not only support learning in early childhood as you know developmentally appropriate, but also would nurture the spirit of the child. Thank you, Jen. And I see Czech. You can speak. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I had a question for Japjeet. The question is: um, Are you able to explain the five Ks of Sikhism to the children in an age-appropriate way? And, and does that start very early? And then the second question is um, for everybody: uh, How do you do deal with the theme of death? as a very big topic that affects everyone and opens the world to spirituality and the life after this world. Uh, and in particular, I, I, I have a book I share with my World Religion College students, The Fall of Freddy the Leaf by Leo Biscaglia, which deals with the topic of death. Can you so share the in the chats? Yes, okay. yes, okay. yes sure, sure. And Japjit? Hi, thanks for your question. Uh, yeah, so in early years, it's really valuable to actually bring those objects into the classroom and actually introduce the objects for what they are and actually the purpose of it. Once those conversations begin, then actually further conversations, the whole idea of curiosity comes into it and they start seeing it around them amongst family members. And so the questions don't just stop in the classroom, they get continued in the home environment, in the place of worship, amongst communities. So it's a really good conversation starter to be able to have the experience of handling those um, 5Ks and being able to feed them on others. Majority of the educators in the setting that I work in are practicing Sikhs. So although we don't showcase our 5Ks to the children, by seeing educators, we're already practicing as Sikhs with the 5Ks, 5Ks meaning that we're baptized Sikhs, it is actually just almost like exposure for the children. So they may not ask the questions, but seeing people around them who are wearing um, the attire or the um, symbols of faith allows them to acknowledge and be able to ask those questions even beyond the setting. As for the um, topic of death, it's not something that's kind of initiated in the classroom, but should anyone lose a member of the family, it's spoken in a very um, normal way as this is actually um, how life and death occurs. And so we will use those conversations from children, again, child initiated, and be able to sort of continue that in different kind of activities and other ways that we can teach the children about the morals, values, and the whole ide ideology behind death, um, and actually the consequence of what effects it might have on the child as well as families. So it's just a good, it's kind of like a conversation starter, but again, child initiated. Thank you, Jabjit. Um, other questions or? Just can, I, can I say a word about about death education okay Cody okay. spiritual context so I draw upon three aspects of curriculum domain that I think need to be covered for all of these sensitive subjects including death and dying uh, and of course they have to be culturally consistent with the tradition that's being taught so uh, I draw upon the first which is what I call encounter that is the experience of being uh, involved in the customs and traditions and practices of the community that is experiencing death or dying particularly for children who are, let's say in the Jewish tradition would then be experiencing the the rituals and the customs that that accompany um, a person's death or indeed uh, the death of a of of a, of a pet or of, of anything that is of value to them um so that, so the way in which those customs um, and the liturgies and the language that is used will inform um, them in a in a very profound way particularly in that in that young uh, age the the tradition and the the texts and the um the prayers and the blessings and the the context and the teachings that come with that will also be uh, a second part of um that learning about uh the nature of death but those two the encounter and the tr the tr tradition um can really only become uh, a component of spiritual searching if it's matched with a reflection an opportunity for reflection 
upon that experience and upon that tradition. So it's really important that the children have the opportunity to talk and to wonder, to question about the very things they're experiencing and they're seeing and they're learning about when it comes to death and dying. And those should be open, wondering questions, questions that uh, will allow for, um, if I may go back to the idea of play, um, a playing with the very nature of what children are experiencing. Because play isn't only just about a game, playing is about the opportunity to, as I said before, to begin to question the unrealized needs and to begin to be thinking about those in a way in which children do it naturally and playing is a form of that. Thank you, Ravi, thank you. Uh, and Cody Robinson, you shared your question, but you can also share it here with us in the chat. You shared your question in the chat. Cody, are you here? I'll read it. Oh. Yes. Go ahead. I'll, I'll read it for Cody. Um, okay. As educators of children and scholars of adolescent development within spiritualities and faith expression, what are some general methods of instruction that lay folk could use that are less overtly paternalistic and commanding and more holistic and cooperative? OK. Any of our panelists, Jane or Japjit? Well, I would say that all of the things that we've been talking about here um, would be less paternalistic and commanding. And, um, but I think that the, the, the starting point is to embrace a holistic understanding of the child include, recognize the soul and the spirit, um, and then find ways to let the children lead. Um, once that happens, at the pedagogy, the instructional methods that are being led by the children's interests and um, the drive and spirit, that will lessen the hierarchical interactions or relationships that we have in the classroom where the teacher is the one that makes all the, the decisions and the students kind of are led to uh, the learning and the instructional process. So if, if we let or allow or permit the students and the children to lead, then we dismantle or dissolve that structure of hierarchy that that we're accustomed to thank you thank you jane there is another question okay katherine uh good morning i'm i've worked with um children for 42 years in religious education in a montessori context and where i found a lot of ownership is in children leading prayer, leading responses to disasters or, you know, deaths within the community or world events, um, leading liturgies for the whole school. So these are skills we begin to teach them. How do we sing together? How do we do prayers together? How do we, and then they build liturgies out of that and they own it, they lead it. <laughs> and it totally reflects their own spirituality. And so that's a gift that can be built over time. But by the time the kids are, you know, even nine years old or younger, you know, they can do this. We had a we had a staff member whose husband died and she was very private and didn't tell anyone and didn't have any public services. But the children heard that her husband had died and they just thought this was not right. And so the oldest class prepared a prayer service for her and invited her to it and then read readings and sang songs and offered reflections just as a ministry to her. And it was totally their uh, initiative. So some, some skill building and then letting them do it uh, around the area of worship and liturgy is, is pretty powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Empowering children is important. And I see another hand, Sola Ayo, yes. Sola Ayo of Rimi. You can speak. Yes, please. Thank you so much for this um, opportunity to share. Uh, 
I'm sharing from a Nigerian perspective, and I think it would also help in other parts of the world. What I understand, the person asking the question, Cody or something, I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. What I understand the person saying is in simple terms, how can we help our children our early, in early childhood to, to have a faith which they own, to have a spiritual experience? And I would say the very first thing would be modeling, being a good example as parents, as teachers, as um, people uh, in the church, in the synagogue, wherever they worship, being that example of spirituality and worship. Because one of the things I thought as we talked is it looks like we're grappling with the terminology of spirituality because we're trying to decide if it's something we do or who we are. And so if we look at it from the perspective of both and not either or, but both and, that would help us to be good examples to the children because when we we see spirituality as who we are and what we do that is who we are that affects what we do so the children would learn as parents model faith and give them uh, assignments to lead faith for example in my context what we do is we have family devotions every day and the children as early as they can speak are given a day to lead prayer and so what do they do? Even if they can't read, they get to be the boss to decide who will read the scripture, who will uh, say, uh, who will um, lead in a song, and they would lead, bring choruses they've heard and hymns they've heard sung over and over and so on. And that becomes their own beginning um, involvement and co collaborative involvement in the faith uh, community. And so they not only respond, they're not there as receivers only, but they're also there as givers. So modeling and involving them from the very beginning, taking them along for everything we do in the worship, just like in the Old Testament, in the Torah, and in the um, Old Testament, in the Bible, where the faith community would take the children along. And I think in Islam too, they have something like that, where the children are taken along every time everything is happening. They are part of the whole process. So Thank that's you. a very key thing, involving them and making sure they're there. And also uh, through repetition, through um, games that would help them to know um, the spiritual constructs and through um, books that we read to them and that picture books that they can look at. Those are just some of them. There are many more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sola, and all of you for being here today. I want to say thank you, our panelists, Ravi Shire, Jabjit, and Jen. Thank you. So can we react for them using the reaction uh, button? We can clap or thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you everyone, it was so good to be here with you.